today. I don't have a slide presentation, but there are several things that I do want to show on here, including the passage that uh, we are looking at. So uh, we will go ahead and take this up. Hopefully, we'll continue this far in the future. All right. Anybody have any special requests they want to mention before we go to prepare for our our Lord, bless our time together. Pray for this young man all that would please recuperate from. Our Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you've given to us. We do thank you that we can come together today to remember Jesus Christ, what he did for us, his successful pain on the cross, that was proven by his resurrection. We thank you for your word which you have preserved for us. We pray, Lord, that we would honestly look at it today and endeavor to understand it and apply it to our lives. We thank you for how you work through uh, people like David and, um, and how you had a, a long-term plan uh, for this life. We know, Lord, that you're also wanting to work in our lives, so we start to be submissive to the work you're wanting to do. I pray today also for this this young man who towards ACL and needing more possibly and needing to have a recovery from this injury. I pray that you would give him a the light and measure of grace and comfort that you use it to draw in close to you and to a good doctor's wisdom also as they assess to try to deal with this, this injury. So we do pray, Lord, that you bless the entire time we have to get to today. We pray that conversation would be edified and that you would empower those of us who have an opportunity to share your word and share the Holy Spirit would give understanding to our hearts in Christ's name. Yeah. Amen. Today we're moving into 2 Samuel chapter 5, and I'm going to be using uh, the Bible reading way as a way of displaying this passage. And um, I think that will be helpful for us. And a couple other um, things that we're going to be looking at as far as a, a study tool as well. And I think, and hopefully that will be a resource that will be useful for you as well. When we come into this passage, I'm not going to read through it as a whole. We're going to work down through it and um, see what we can learn from this day. We see that uh, we have David being made king over a united Israel in this passage. That's very important. Because for seven years, he had been king over the tribe of Judah and, uh, and was ruling on Hebron. This week we have a big change where he becomes king over United Israel, all 12 tribes, and then he also moves his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. And uh, there's some important things that uh, we, we gain from this. First, let's look at what's happening in verses 1 and 2. It says, Not all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron and told him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, when Saul was our king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord told you, you will be the shepherd of my people Israel. You will be Israel leader. So what we have here, actually, is an overture from the northern tribes. Now, overture may not be a word to use, but it basically means that it's an approach or a proposal made to someone 
with the aim of opening negotiations or establishing a relationship. And that's exactly what's being done here. Now keep in mind that David with the, the, the tribe of Judah and the other tribes of Israel, which are at this point called Israel, is a little bit a little bit confusing when you're reading these books here. Right now, Israel is eleven tribes, and you have Judah. But after this point, all is it is Although the tribes maintain their identity, and you still may hear references to individual tribes, especially the tribe of Judah. Eventually, there's going to be a split, and you're going to have the northern tribes of Israel, and you're going to have a tribe of Judah again for a while. We're going to be nice here. So I often will refer to the northern tribes as opposed to referring to Israel, since Israel has a couple of meanings depending on what time period you're in. You can remember, they just prior to this, I've been having a civil war, and so it was a, a devastating time, a difficult time, um, and so this is definitely a situation in which they're trying to establish a relationship that they had not had. Now, one of the commentators that I use uh, by the last name of Music said prior to this, only one of the tribes of Israel recognized David as king. The other tribes recognized Ishbosheth, the son of Saul. Ishbosheth was murdered, as recorded in 2 Samuel 4. So now the tribes turn to David. Now, that, that is a true statement. There's no doubt about it. But we have to keep in mind that Ishbosheth's death was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And um, it's the climax of this continuing story. And, and there's more to the story because of that. And, and if we just kind of read that statement only and forget about what went before, I think that we don't really completely appreciate all that's uh, been done here. And so we're going to kind of uh, go back and look at some other events that were part of this of the rising action that we're leading to this climax. So we're actually going to look at some of those events, and we're going to work our way backward as far as looking at those events. So first, moving backward, we would see that the death of Abner was also influential in bringing about this overture. In chapter 4, verse 1, it says that when Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard about Abner's death that he brought, he lost all courage, and all Israel became paralyzed with fear. So that definitely was increasing the tension, you might say, leading to something that had to happen. Of course, after that, then Ishbosheth is murdered. But but Ishbosheth, you know, in here is even you know losing all courage, and Abner wasn't really his friend. I mean, Abner perhaps had slept with one of his concubines or wives, and. He accused him, and Abner said, I'm going to get very angry about the accusations, and I'm going to turn the kingdom over uh, to David. And Abner was the number two man, technically, but he really was the power man. He was the strong man. He was propping up Ishbosheth. He could have delivered those tribes because he really had the power with the military behind him. Ishbosheth was more of a figurehead than anything else. And so even though uh, Abner was not friendly to Ishbosheth. We see here in this situation that Ishbosheth at least realized that he was the one who was kind of um, holding the coalition together and uh, maintaining peace. And without it, who knows what would happen? And in that case, we do know what happened. He himself was assassinated. So, if Abner had been that commander of the military for the northern tribes, and, and um, he was definitely uh, the strong man there. And so the loss of that really created some political instability. Well, second, as far as going backward in time with this rise in action, you can see that there are verses in chapter 3 that indicate that the elders of the northern tribes were not happy with the status quo even before the death of Abner and Ishbosheth. In verse 17 of chapter 3, it says, Meanwhile, Abner had consulted with the elders of Israel. For some time now, he told them, you have wanted to make David your king. Now is the time. For the Lord has said, I have chosen David to save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from all their enemies. Now that's, that's an interesting statement there. You know, when he says that 
for some time now you wanted to make David your king. So you had had a dissatisfaction there, which could have been in part uh, from, you know, just, you know, Ishbosheth being a weak leader, but it could very well have been in part because they were not doing well in that civil war with Judah. Remember the battle when Basil was killed, or Asahel, however you say his name? In that battle, the northern tribes lost 360 men, while the tribe of Judah lost its 20, including Asahel. So that was the beginning of, so that was just kind of an example. You had David's and Judah becoming stronger and stronger, and Saul's dynasty weaker. In fact, it says that in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, that was the beginning of a long war between those who were loyal to Saul and those loyal to David. As time passed, David became stronger and stronger, while Saul's dynasty became weaker and weaker. There's also an interesting statement that um, that Joab or Abner had made. Uh, he said, he used to quote actually, this for the Lord has said. I have chosen David to save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from all their enemies. So, if you do a comparison of the translation, you see that that's, that is the, pretty much rendered as a quote, that part where it says, for the Lord has said, and then the quote, I've chosen David to save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from all their enemies. So, but what we're not told is who said that. We're not told, you know, was it something that Samuel had said? Was it something that another prophet had said? Was it something that the Lord had revealed to David and, and he had somehow communicated that? We're not sure, but they had that information. And of course, that's hopeful information, but it's talking about saving them from the Philistines. It's talking about David's reign being something that would be beneficial to them. But they had not, to this point, um, accepted that. Now, you might think, well, they didn't have an opportunity. Well, actually, they did. Again, as we work backward in this backstory and down the rise in action, we can see that David had made the first overture of peace. Remember when that was? When had he tried to reach out? Interesting situation. You remember when Saul and his sons were killed? The Philistines took and hung their bodies on the wall of one of the cities. You had the people of Jabesh Gilead, some great people there, who traveled a long way to go and take those bodies down and give them an appropriate, let's say, burial, burning body, you know, appropriate, and they're not just slain. You know, on the walls there. And the people of David Gilead had done that because Saul. And one of the good things that Saul did early on is he had come to their aid early in his reign when they had been surrounded by the Greeks. And so they had remembered that. And so they had gone and done this very brave deed. David was impressed by that because even though he had been running from Saul for 10 years, he still respected Saul as the person that God had put in place. And he was waiting for God to take him out of it. He was not going to be the one that did that. He was not going to approve of anybody else doing that. And uh, so we have him uh, appreciating what they did. And in fact, um, we have David's offer mentioned in chapter 2, and uh, which is gracious, gracious and diplomatic. He said, when David heard that the men of Jabesh Gilead had buried Saul, he sent them this message. May the Lord bless you for being so loyal to your master Saul and giving him a decent burial. May the Lord be loyal to you in return and reward you with his unfailing love. And I too will reward you for what you have done. Now that Saul is dead, I ask you to be my strong and loyal subjects like the people of Judah who have anointed me as their new king. I mean, I mean, if that isn't a, an olive leaf, what is it? You know, olive branch. I mean, I mean, that was a wonderful thing. It wasn't. It was a promise of good things to come. Now you say, well, um, it wasn't everybody. 
Um, that was just those people of Jabesh and Gilead. But even though they didn't represent all the modern tribes, had they accepted his offer, it could have encouraged the other tribes to do as well. He was using an opportunity there to try to bring some reconciliation that potentially could have avoided that long civil war. We're not doing a, a lot of details regarding the long civil war. We had that one battle I told you about that was devastating to the northern tribes, and we had that other situation where they had representatives of both armies getting together and all the young men dying with these sword fights, dagger fights, or whatever it was, hand to hand combat. It was terrible stuff. Many people were killed. Many people who were pawns of the Gustav. <laughs> I'm speaking as a person who's been in the military, thankfully I never had to see you know, combat action, but there are so many situations in which soldiers die because of somebody else's idea. And um, and there are just many, you know, on both sides of conflicts who don't necessarily share the goal, and the goal may not even be worth fighting for, but they fight it out for And so so you have that, that going on there. So there's some significant water under the bridge by this time after they've had the Civil War. But we're going to see in this story coming up that in spite of that, in spite of the fact that it wasn't avoided here, that they, they make a covenant and they make, they make peace here together. <coughs> well, you know, I think there's one application we can kind of make here. It's sad that the tribes only turned to David in spite of this other information they've been given from this prophet or somebody else. It's sad that they only turned to David when their previous choice of Ishbosheth and Abner, you might say, was taken away. They have these same reasons that they give here existed before they died. But you know what, quite frankly, we often do the same. And as Christians, we should be Christ followers. So often people would describe a Christian as a person who believes certain truths. And that is true. There are essential truths you need to believe about Jesus Christ especially and about your sinful nature for you to be a part of God's family, for you to be a Christian. But it doesn't stop with intellectual assent. It doesn't stop with that act of faith applied to your life. It should go on with being a Christ follower. In fact, quite frankly, I like that phrase better than just Christian, since I don't think that Christian always carries as much information as it should. But a Christ follower, is not someone who just does what we want to do. And many Christians do that. Or they allow themselves to be led astray by other people or worldly philosophies. And they're not following Christ. And so, even though it's sad that these people only turned to David when their previous choice was taken away, it's also sad that when Christians finally recognize Jesus as king and follow him when their other choices fail. There are many of us as Christians who have to learn from that school of hard knocks. And uh, we really should be more proactive than that and choose Jesus outright, not just when other options fail. Well, let's take a look again at the three reasons for this peace overture. They're found in verses uh, 1 and 2. Let me ask you, how would you phrase the first one? The first reason. Mm -hmm. We're related, exactly. The elders of Israel sought David's leadership because he was an Israelite himself. Israelite using in the, the broader all 12 tribes. Okay? Yes. They're related. Excellent. Coming from, we are your own flesh and blood. Alright, what's the second reason? 
He has experience. Excellent. The elders of Israel sought David's leadership because he had already displayed his ability to lead. Very good. And you know what? He did that when he was serving Saul and serving with some of these military leaders, almost undoubtedly. And so it's not like just hearing about him. They may have actually been under him, trained by him, fought with him. So good. There is the third reason. Excellent. Because it says there in the end, and the Lord told you, you will be the shepherd of the people. So we have the third reason the elders of Israel sought David's leadership, because it was evident God had called him to lead. Now this is actually, this, this phrase here, you will be the shepherd, is an uh, interesting phrase. That's what we call the first metaphoric use of shepherd regarding the leadership of people. In other words, it's a direct statement that David is or will be the shepherd of the house of Israel. And the concept of shepherd in regard to men is only used three times previously in Scripture. If you go back to Genesis 28, 14, you see Jacob, who's an interesting character, who made it well. Had a lot of problems for him. He ended well, worshiping on his staff, and his blessings to his children and uh, to Joseph's children are, are really, really quite beautiful. But he, he refers to the God who has been my shepherd. And in Genesis 49 24, Jacob refers to God as the shepherd, the rock of Israel. So we have that concept of sharing in regard to God and the people of Israel. And then in Numbers 27, 15 to 17, we have Moses expressing concern for the Israelites just before Joshua was appointed. And he also uses this imagery of a shepherd. He said, says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, you are the God who gives breath to all creatures. Please appoint a new man as leader for the community. Give them someone who will guide them wherever they go and will lead them into battle. So the community of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, so that is a weaker comparison. That would be more of a simile. But it is still definitely a comparison to the idea of people shepherding. It's not as strong as that direct statement that we have in 2 Samuel 5. That's really the only verses in Scripture prior to this time that, that, that use that concept of shepherding. Now, it would greatly expand from here. If we had time, we could spend the rest of the time talking about how David went and developed the concept of God being his shepherd and of him being a shepherd. And then we see throughout the prophets the idea that the leaders are supposed to be like shepherds and the priests and so on. Yes? I just keep thinking of Micah 5 2. You, Bethlehem, ever jarred on the least among the princes of. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And not only that, but we also have been taught in New Testament times that Jesus is the good shepherd. And then we also have that concept being applied to the elders of the church that they're supposed to be the under shepherds. So even though we have a congregational system of government and you uh, as far as our church goes and you elect elders and deacons, what you're really doing, or supposed to be doing, is confirming whom you think God has called to that role. You should be recognizing qualities and traits, etc. Um, you know, and then basically we can agree about that. Yes, I remember a question for how to give you shelter Yes. Absolutely. Right, and it's a great example because this should be after their own. Anybody who has the privilege and responsibility to work as an under shepherd in a church flock should recognize they are directly under the Lord and they need to be. So that's that's a really, rather interesting um, thing. And now, here's, here's another interesting thing. I don't know the background behind it. But actually, the idea of rulers being shepherds had to become 
a thing, a concept, with some of the other governments around Egypt and, and some of the other nations. Very good. And, and it's almost like they were, they were, had developed that idea before it was developed here. Which is a little strange, really. Um, I'm interested in that sense. Um, maybe they saw it, the practical value of that. You know, to be a leader, a good leader, a benevolent monarch, you know, things can go well for your nation. Um, but because they didn't have the same foundation that we have in regard to shepherd or servant leadership as it's often called us. So we have to move on. All right. So next, let's go to verse 3. So it says, so, so there he brought, King David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel. Now this is a Greek statement for a momentous event. Not only is the war between the northern tribes and Judah ending, but the northern tribes are placing themselves under David. Okay, not just peace, and you go back home and sit over there and don't cross the territory. No. This is beyond the peace treaty. This is a unifying of the nations, which is really quite remarkable. Now, this covenant demanded the people's loyalty. It allowed them to maintain a sense of tribal privilege and individual dignity. It served as a constitution containing stipulations obligating both the king and the people. We don't have the word in for it. But it's also a day of great rejoicing. I really need to show you a, uh, a parallel passage here. All right, so we have an account of some of the people in David's army. And we have talked about this first section about the people who joined him early on. But um, down here, we have the an account of those who joined David at Hebron, and then um, who also were part of this unifying. So just look at some of these highlighted things. These are the numbers of armed warriors who joined David at Hebron. They were all eager to see David be, become king instead of Saul, just as the Lord had promised. From the tribe of Judah, warriors armed with shields and spears. The next tribe, brave warriors. Uh, Levi, Zadok, a brave warrior and officers. Benjamin, most of the men from Benjamin had not been loyal to Saul until this time. That's an interesting, significant change. Next tribe, brave warriors, each highly respected in his own clan. Half tribe of Manasseh. 18,000 were designated by name to help David become king. From the tribe of Issachar, 200 leaders who understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. Zebulun, skilled warriors, fully armed and prepared for battle, and completely loyal to David. Now we have officers and warriors from the tribe of Naphtali, many more from the tribe of Dan, trained warriors from Asher. And then many uh, from the uh, tribes of Reuben and Gad and half tribe of Manasseh. And notice what it says: All these men came in battle array to Hebron with the single purpose of making David the king over all Israel. And in fact, everyone in Israel agreed that David should be their king. They feasted and drank with David for three days. For preparations had been made by the relatives for their arrival. And people from a far away, as his car, Zebulun, and Naphtali brought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and oxen, vast supplies of flour, pig pigs, clusters of raisins, wine, olive oil, cattle, sheep, and goats were brought to the celebration. There was great joy throughout the land of Israel. And we believe that it is a, de a, a more detailed description of this covenant that was being made. And so we have a very, um, you might say, a a great celebration. Must be nervous. Yes. I don't chapter in the Bible. This was this was from um first chronicle. This was a parallel passage from First Chronicles twelve. 
So, so you'll, you'll remember that First Chronicles won't actually repeat some things in First and Second Samuel. Okay. In the Jewish Bible, Chronicles comes later, kind of like as a summary book. It's not a place where it is in our part of it. And if you understand that placement, it would kind of make sense. All right. Let's continue on over here in regard to uh, this covenant. So it was a day of, uh, of tremendous uh, rejoicing, and he was anointed king over a united, unified nation. You remember he had been previously anointed by Samuel and then over Judah. Now, verse 4, what we actually have here is just a summary statement. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in all. He had reigned over Judah from Hebron for seven years and six months, and from Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. Samuel anointed David when he was about 15, and he did not take the throne until about 30. He was being chased around by Saul for about 10 years. And so really, he, he rose to a great position in those first five years. And third Saul so well, as we saw, everywhere from being his personal musician to being a general for him, if that's the term that they would have used, was being a tremendous warrior for him and a leader. And yet, of course, Samuel rejected him out of jealousy, and we know all that story. But um, we have that... Who remember they had 10 years running from Saul. They ran for 40 years. And so David had 15 years of preparation. And some of that very difficult preparation. But God typically uses great preparation when the task to come is great. And David learned a lot from those experiences that he applied during his life. And then after that, in this chapter, what we have is a, a statement, that's not really the best, I mean, David has been captured Jerusalem, but it's not really an out, outline of the context of this, this chapter. What we really have here then, following, is the listing of how God blessed David, proving that he had chosen David. Yes, sir. Um, I was just thinking, you know, when I think of... I guess all these years when I thought of David and his men, you know, like Robin Hood, you know, hiding and running and doing their things, I've always pictured him as like, I guess like in the movies, you know, he's 30, 35, maybe 36, you know, he's a burly guy and all these people. He could have been 21 years old. Oh, well, 22 it. years old. I mean, that blows my mind to think that such a young man, of course, he grew up more quickly with the responsibilities and whatnot that he had. But think of that. He could have been 20 or 21 years old. Well, he was. He was in his 20s. He was in all those. Well, he was in hiding, and all these people flocked into him, which makes it more remarkable. Why should 600 men or whatever flock to this? A young person had that yeah. kind of confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Well, because he proved himself. Yeah, it's very good. It's just startling. Right. So, I mean, uh, this is the thing about leadership a leader is a person who leads, not a person who's appointed. Fishbashet wasn't a leader. This possession of king. But there's, there's a very big difference. And sometimes you'll have significant leaders who don't have a title, but they just don't lead. And that's and, and just based upon, you know, the, the qualities that they have and the way that the Lord has you know, given them. Well, so the first blessing we have mentioned here is the military blessing. That's what we have in these next couple verses. It says, David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against Rebekah the Second Samuel 5 now. Led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. The Jebusites taunted David, saying, You'll never get in here. Even the blind and lame will keep you out. For the Jebusites thought they were safe. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the City of David. And, um, and so that's the, the first part of that. Military blessing. The Jebusites had been in Israel for about 500 years, and as far as we know, not found for that amount of time. That's absolutely amazing. That's longer ago than when the Pilgrims came. Okay, so so that's huge. No wonder they had you know this great confidence that you know they they could not be conquered. But we should also remember that in Abraham's time, this was called the city of Salem. 
Because King was, you know, kids of death. Very interesting story. No time to go. And it was not very far away that there was another very important mountain, Mount Moriah, where Abraham had been asked to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. This location was also very important because it was on the border between the northern tribes and Judah. And in fact, you have a couple of interesting statements about when they had tried to fight Jerusalem before, even under Joshua. How many years had passed since they came into the land? <laughs> about 400. I mean, a long time. Okay? And they had initially tried, but they failed. One passage says, the people from the tribe of Judah could not conquer them, and the other passage says, the people from the tribe of Benjamin couldn't conquer them, which indicates they're right there in that You had Judah, you had Benjamin, and so this was actually a diplomatic location as well for a unified nation, since it wasn't right in the middle of any particular tribal territory. And so that's really kind of a, a good side as well. And so he had several, several good, good reasons uh, why this was a good place. It was fortified and uh, was pretty easily beset, defended, both because of its fortifications and also because of the way it was situated on the hill with valleys around it. And so it was desirable, military, geographically, and symbolically. As we come and, and we see that the basic statement that David is successful. But then we go back and we have more details about this military success. It says, on the day of the attack, David said to his troops, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. He basically turned them and saw back upon them. He says, whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through the water tunnel. That is the origin of the saying, the blind and the lame may not enter the house. Now, people have debated exactly what the blind and the lame may not enter the house means. But it's kind of like a proverb, which certainly had meaning to them that that reflects how important this battle was. So we just kind of get that idea. It kind of came into the common everyday, you know, household word saying language, you know, based upon the success of this battle that's going on here. And so it said that who are attached and struck to go in the city to the water tunnel. Now that's a, a very interesting um, thought, and there has been a number of of ideas as to how that happened. I wanted to show you something as part of this lesson today. Um, so this is a good resource. This is this is the Bible study app. It's really excellent. It doesn't cost anything to download it, but it has, uh, you can choose uh, various versions and various uh, resources to put side by side. Some of the materials in here is, uh, are free. And uh, some are an extra page. So, for instance, this archaeologic study Bible notes over here is uh, something that I paid for extra to get it to have. But take a look at this. This is an example of the borders of the city of Jerusalem. And in that upper portion of there, that little square, you have the Gihon Spring, which was so important to the defense of the city. They built a fortification, a wall around the spring, so it couldn't be cut off. And then to have access to it, there were two different tunnels built. One, Warren's shaft, and then another one that they believed literally dated from the Jebusites' time. They came down to this end of the city. So the thought is that, I mean, there's, there's doubt that Warren's shaft existed at that time. But they do think the other one did. And so the thought is that the Israelites were able to um, to make use of one of those shafts to gain access. Because it talks through the, the water tunnel. And so we see the statement. So David made the fortress his own. And he called it the city of David. And he extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces and working inward. And David became more and more powerful. He finished that sentence with this second. One more uh, image here to look at. This is uh, a little more fleshed out view of the very same diagram. You see the same shape there. And if you look carefully at it, you can see Mount Moriah up here. And then you have this area here where the Gihon Spring is in. And, uh, and it's protected. Eventually you have 
David's palette is going to be over here. And so it's going to, uh, this is the, the city right there. And so he, he um, started to develop this as well. So he has had some military blessing from the Lord. And let's take a look at verse 10. It became more and more powerful because the Lord God of heaven's army is with him. Again, military success proves the Lord's empowerment. Going down to verse 11, we have an example of a political blessing. It says, Then King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David, along with cedar timber and carpenters and stone masons, and they built David a palace. And David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel, and had blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. That's a tremendous thought. He was not taking credit for himself. He didn't think that God blessed him just because of himself. But he blessed him to be able to serve the people Israel. Now, um, that is, um, this building of the palace actually happened years later in David's reign. Because we know that Hiram overlapped Solomon, but it's given here an example of how again how God was blessed with the man He chose to lead Israel. Not everything is always in strict chronological order. And then we finish with an interesting uh, couple verses that talk about personal blessing. Thirteen years sixteen after moving from Hebron to Jerusalem, David married more concubines and wives, and they were sons and daughters. And it gives the names of the sons that were born uh, while he was in Jerusalem. So, this is an interesting passage. Believe it or not, it still is an example of personal blessing. It may make you wonder when you see that he was following the practice of royalty at that time and having all these wives and concubines. So, Royalty at that time often did marriages that had a diplomatic element to them. The concubines, by the way, were wives of an inferior status. They just weren't one night standings or anything were provided for, etc. But they, they were a lower level of a, of a wife, an wife of an inferior status. And Solomon, you remember, took it to the extreme, even during foreign women had a negative effect on them spiritually. We don't have any, I don't know of an indication that David necessarily married foreign women. Or any foreign women that had, they weren't following um, the God of Israel. And so he did not take it to that extreme. Now, however, if you remember, if you looked at it before, Deuteronomy 17, there's a passage that was given directly to some future kings of Israel. And one of those verses in Deuteronomy 17 17 said, Neither shall they multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. And that really happened with Solomon. So I hate, to, I hate to end on this weird note because it might, it might surprise you, but scripture does not actually specifically prohibit abortion. It is a lot of It does not. It does contradict God's creation order, his plan of one man and one woman, and scripture reports the difficulties of this arrangement on more than one occasion. And, and, and how about this? In the New Testament, Scripture does prohibit church leaders from having more than one. Right? Doesn't one way, but um, and it's definitely against the law in our land, and I believe primarily it's a protection for the women and children. So this this is an interesting topic to discuss a little bit more. Uh, it does seem like he's in violation of Deuteronomy 17, 17, but multiplying. But that can't exactly be taken to mean you couldn't have had a second or a third. It's kind of talking about many, you know. And there's really no scripture fantasy that very specifically, you know, brings it down there. But I asked you this question in this last couple of verses what is the true blessing on David? It wasn't the wives and the confidence, it's the children. It's the children. Mm -hmm. Now remember, the children are born from these marriages. And scripture is very clear that they are good from God and not just a result of a violent blessing. So we have a situation here where you have Solomon, who's the son of an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, a lot of David's coming through that. And we have Nathan, whose line would show up in marriage. 
And so we have an example here of God blessing David in spite of his shortcomings. God hasn't yet revealed it to David, but David has long-term plans for the Davidic dynasty. And this is one thing we should learn from this. David's failures or the failures of anyone after him will not be that much. Okay? I just wanted to point out, if I may, that more than one one is many. Oh, man. I, I didn't agree with <laughs> For those of you who are visiting that lady over there, it's very familiar to me. <laughs> My pocketbook didn't have to be sick. I think Jesus makes it plain when he says that for this cause, shall the two become one. Right. When he says two become one, he goes back. To the um, to Genesis, right. where God originally intended the marriage law, He enacted the marriage law, and um, also, I mean, we as well, Christians, there are a couple of ways we go back to Genesis. We also go back to Genesis nine regarding the food laws, when God blesses all creatures and said they can all be food for you, right? right. But don't eat the blood. And so, you know, we can see how Jesus brought us back several times to the original intention that God had. For yes, I think his statement there concerning man and man and wife is, is very strong. I agree. I'm not in any point of saying the ability is okay. I just point out the thing that there's not a verse in there that says he you know, had more than one wife. But you want to follow the creation order? Yeah, I had one wife. Okay. I try to take care of that. I was just take care of it. Uh-huh. All right. This was a very father. Thank you again for preserving for us this history so that we can learn from it, Lord. We thank you that you are in control, that you can work through our lives. We pray that you would do so. Pleasant times again. Thank you. I like to be. Amen.